desires, or just saying, by those evil desires in me that I had not crucified with Christ, put to death in my faith, those are the things that led me into sin. No, they said concupiscence led me into sin because I was born that way. Total perversion of the scriptures. So they get the idea then that something dwells inside your flesh that's inbred into you. It's this, in, it's this corrupted nature inbred into man in his flesh. But see, again, in scripture, flesh is just flesh. It's just sarks. It's just what covers the bone. There's nothing mysterious about the flesh. When the scripture says, I know that in my flesh dwells no good thing, he's talking about in my passions and desires given over to my lust, lustful ways dwells no good thing. That's what the writer means. Why? Because he's coming off the angle of the principle of growth, that the nature of man is based on his patterns of behavior throughout his life the choices that he made to become a slave to sin. That's what. So to justify this bad seed thing, this depravity, this no ability, that we have to have alternatives to repentance and, and obedience, to serving God in obedience and truth and purity, that's what they've done to the Scriptures. It's very, very simple if you look at it, what the Scriptures and what the words mean that you can explode this myth, but it's so difficult for people that say, no, well, I agree with you there, Mike, in principle, but, but yet my, you still have something in your flesh that makes you sin. No, you have a choice that makes you sin. No temptation has befallen, but such is common to man. Okay, of course, that's said to the brethren that with the temptation, God will give you a way of escape, but even to anyone outside the faith, you can resist the temptation, but you don't want to. You do what you desire to do. The evil desires. Not concupiscence. concupiscence. So, there we go. The King James writers, because they bought into this moral depravity, original sin nonsense, the translators used three passages. They translate desire. Just the word desire should have been desire or lust. Or evil desires would have been a better way to put it. And they translated it into this invented word out of the Latin, so that they can erase the idea of nature, the principle of growth, and say, in your very fleshly nature is sin dwelling there. The stain is within you. You're born with that bad seed. It's complete nonsense. Let's get to Romans chapter 1. We see this progression that Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 1. Man is not born in this state of depravity without ability to obey God. No, he shows it very clearly. Starting in verse 16, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. In other words, they hold it back. They won't listen to it. Because what can be, may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, his whole divinity, is seen here, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. So here we go. What's the progression Paul's talking about? Did he start off and say that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against these people because they're born in their sins and they're wicked to the core and he's going to destroy them like he did in Noah's time? No, he didn't say that. He said that what could be known of God is manifest to them. They know God, although they knew him. See, since the creation of the world through the, the attributes of his creation is revealed to him, they knew him. What did they do? They rejected that knowledge. This is not complete and precise knowledge like, in, like I've talked about before in the scriptures, like a knowledge of the truth or a, a full knowledge of the truth like Hebrews 10.26 talks about. That's a correct and precise knowledge. Here is a knowledge that you know God exists through his creation. So what happens? Their foolish heart is dark. They have futile thoughts. 
futile thoughts, and their foolish hearts are darkened. They profess to be wise in their wisdom. And then what happens to them? Very next verse. After that, they profess to be wise. They become fools. These people who believe this theology, they become fools. The wretched man, the chief of sinners nonsense, sin every day in thought, word, and deed. They become fools. They exchange the glory of the incorruptible God into an image. Image. Okay? Keep that in mind. Made like corruptible man. Of birds and four-footed beasts, you know, creeping things, stones, altars, all that stuff. Because he's talking about from creation. He's not talking about just from the advent of the, of the church on earth. That's in Revelation 13 where they create an, an image, an image after their corruptible man. What's corruptible man? With his concupiscence, his evil desires, his corrupted nature, his bad seed. So he's the he has to be saved in his sins, called out of that. He's dead in his sins. He can't do anything, has no ability to do anything is right. Even children are depraved. So he has to be called out of that by some kind of an election or provenient grace or something to offset that nature. That's what corruptible man is. That's their corruption, what they've done to the image of Christ that's presented to the world today for the most part, except for the few of us crying at the gates. It's, it's presented in the wretched man, filthy rags, chief of sinners, can't do anything right, and if you can do anything right, you can save yourself. That's the way it's been presented, as we've shown over and over again. So with the, there's the progression. What happens to them? Then... After they've done this, God gives them over to their uncleanness. What's he mean? To their passions and desires of their flesh that what? They refuse to crucify. The scriptures tell you those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Romans chapter 6, from verses 4 through 6 all the way down to 16 and 17, that's all it's talking about is crucifying, being buried with Christ, being raised the newness of life, being dead to sin. That's all it's talking about. Then sin no longer has dominion over you. Then you're a servant of righteousness instead of a servant to uh, sin unto death. That's what it's talking about here. They refuse to do that. So that's why God, he, God, they're given over to their passions, their evil desires. Because why? God's not going to intervene on the will of man. That's why. You're going to do what you want to do, shake your fist and thumb your nose at God until the judgment. So God gives them up because they what? They exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. Okay, they exchange the truth of God. First they're darkened in their minds, in their hearts. Then they create this image. This is a progression of depravity, okay? Then they exchange the truth of God for a lie. Been over it a hundred times. The lie, the substitution, the moral transfer, the wretched man stuff. Then they're given up to their passions. They give themselves over to their passions, and God says, you're in it. Just like in Proverbs chapter 1, where he says, you're, you're calamity, you're going to call on me, I won't answer, You've, I'll hide my, hide my face from you, because you would not listen to my reproof, and you would not take any of my rebuke, you wouldn't listen to any of my instructions. So now, die in your sins, perish. That's what you chose. The path you chose. Because you've got to strive to enter through the narrow gate. You've got to put forth an agonizing effort to come through that. And then it's reprobation. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. And then we go into the vile, vile passions that we see all over the church world today. The perversion of sex. The men and women and women and men. All the things that are happening. The people in the pulpits even in those vile, ruinous sins preaching the gospel as though God loves everything and everything's hunky-dory while they're living in that type of perversion. So that's, and it goes on. He says, so, so and, he, and he says here in verse, in verse 28, he says, so even though they did not, he says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. See, they had, they had the knowledge of God. All the scientists that deny creation, all in, in the intelligent design, as they call it, all these people that deny that you have to take up your cross, deny that you're able to obey God, it's the same thing. They will not retain those things in their thoughts. They will not love the truth, like 2 Thessalonians says. 
That's what happened to them there. They, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They loved not the truth that they might be saved by it. They hate the truth. So God gives them up to a debased mind. So they do the things that are not fitting. Reversal of nature. That's what's happened. Reversal of all the scriptures. Everything's in reverse, as we've shown time and again, in a reversal of nature. You've got men with men, women with women. You've got adultery and fornication and uncleanness and, and people running around with you. You've got every manner of vileness going on in the churches. Pornography is rampant, all the rest of it. So that's the progression, the natural progression of this principle of growth in reverse, going down to the debased mind that your pundits are saying you're born with. And you're not born with that. You do have the ability to do what's right and to make a right choice. And of course, I know they'll raise the issue about children. And they say that, well, how come children steal and they lie and they do all these things, bad things to their friends? Well, did you ever see a child raised in an environment with two godly families and raising them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord and raising up a child in the way he should go so he will, when he gets old he won't depart from it? Well, I have. I've seen that happen with our grandchildren, which we had a great opportunity to spend a lot of time with them as they grew up in both sides of the family in, in the relationship with God. See, it's example that they follow. You learned by tradition from your fathers. Just like Peter says there. See, you learn that, you learn that stuff by tradition from your fathers. That's in 1 Peter chapter 1, where he, ta where he talks about <clears throat> he says, uh, you knowing that you were not redeemed with, pre with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but by the precious blood of Christ,